dreamers, the issue was far from the top of the agenda at the annual gathering. The only panel dedicated to the topic was held in a small, windowless room at 5 p.m. on Thursday, after many attendees had already left for one of the conference's many boozy receptions. And though the panel was titled, You May Say You're a Dreamer, But You're Not the Only One, it focused very little on the dreamer population, the group of upwards of one million undocumented immigrants who were brought to the U.S. as children and whose legal protections were rescinded by the Trump administration last year and will expire in early March. Uh, as an editorial aside, he's talking about DACA recipients, not dreamers, but anyway. Okay, back to our story. Instead, the event became a general airing of fears and grievances about both legal and illegal, illegal immigration. The panel's moderator, Christopher Malagisi, claimed without evidence a ploy by Democrats to offer immigrants a path to citizenship in exchange for their votes. Representative Michael Burgess, a Republican from Texas, who faces a primary from a Trumpian hard-right newcomer, similarly accused Democrats of putting the economic interests of young immigrants over those of young American citizens. Whenever Beer cited research to counter incorrect claims from his fellow panelists and the audience that recent immigrants are disproportionately criminal, are an economic drain on government, or take several generations to learn English, he was met with vocal hostility. During a heated question and answer session during the immigration panel, a man from Four Corners, Virginia, went on an extended diatribe about a Latino man who once crashed his car in front of his house. I had to go down to court to testify, and I was the only white face in the crowd other than the lawyers being paid to translate for these people, he said. You can go down to Four Corners Park and see obvious illegal immigrants defecating in the woods fornicating in the woods, and on and on and on. These people are not the immigrants of the 20s and 30s. They will never be able to get good jobs here and be good citizens. Is that in your study? Struggling to be heard over the loud applause that ensued, Beer responded, quote, If you look at the data, the people committing crimes are overwhelmingly native-born Americans. So if you want to talk about the effect of immigrants on the crime rate, they actually lower the crime rate, resulting in a safer society. Obviously, there are some immigrants who do commit crimes, just like there are some who committed crimes back when the Irish were the ones coming in. Oh, I'm Irish. Don't talk about the Irish, an older woman angrily called out. Guys, guys, let him respond, the moderator pleaded with the audience as the crosstalk and scoffing grew louder. Only a hand, small handful of people came up to beer afterwards to offer support and sympathy. Among them was Carolyn Meadows, the vice chair of the American Conservative Union, which organizes on CPAC. I think you're a brave young man, she said. I really do. Thank you for coming. Still, speaking to TPM after the panel wrapped up, Beer said he still believes in the power of facts and research to convince conservatives of the benefits of immigration. The data is the thing that's going to win people over, he said. It's just about showing them that immigrants are not what they think they are and hoping that falls on receptive ears. There are people who can be convinced, people who know immigrants personally, who know they are contributing to society and they're not all defecating in the woods. But having attended CPAC for the last six years, Beer has conceded that the Republican basis attitude towards immigrants has not significantly shifted. I don't think it's that different from past years, he said. There's always a large contingent most passionate about immigration, about opposing it. It certainly seems like the passion is always with the side that wants to restrict it and not with the side that wants it to be more open. Well, my response to that, Mr. Beer, would be you're talking to the wrong people if you want to find people who have a passion to be more open. But I think this story is very telling um, because it really points to how close-minded and just resistant to information a lot of these people are. They just simply do not want to hear it. They saw this one guy saw somebody crash his car in front of his house. And from that, he extrapolates all of those people are bad. Uh, somebody saw somebody doing something in the woods, and um, he's assuming that they're immigrants, 
and he's assuming that all immigrants are like that because of these people that he saw that he assumed were immigrants, seemingly obvious illegal immigrants. How you would know that, I don't know. And on and on and on. These are people who are simply not listening. So that's one reason why I, why I think the, the larger dreamer issue is so important because it, it shows us, I guess, I mean, it, it's, it's the bellwether. There you go. That's better than calling it the canary in the coal mine. It's the bellwether in terms of it shows us how reasonable or open to reason, I guess you might say, uh, that the quote-unquote other side is on this issue. It, as If they say, okay, well, these guys deserve our support, then, all right, at least they're open to, you know, if you meet their exacting standards, then yes, you deserve their support. So that's something. That's It's a crack in the door. It's something that says this is at least a point past which I will not go. But there are a lot of these people, obviously, obviously. Louis Gohmert, I mean, you remember his thing about uh, dreamers coming over here with calves the size of cantaloupes because they're bringing illegal drugs. I mean, there are people who literally um, just, they're not buying it. As far as they're concerned, all immigrants are bad. Uh, all illegal immigrants are criminals of the highest order. They're, they're you know, you can't trust them with anything. They would kill you in your sleep if they had half a chance. You know, there is a contingent that just believes that and will not believe anything else no matter what. And um, we just hope that they're the, a small one. But I don't know. It's not that they're not that small. It's not that small a, a group, I guess. Um, but see, it's not just immigration. I mean, this is this is uh, something that you find across the board on a number of subjects. Here is another article that gives you another sense. So, as you read this, notice the similarities similarities to the last article that I just read, and consider, you know, what we're up against with some of these people here, because they are literally as closed as a closed. They're as closed-minded as a clo any closed thing anywhere, you know. It's like closed and locked up tight and nothing is going to get in. So, so check this out. This is entitled, Conservatives Freak Out After Speaker Dares to Mention That Trump Bragged About Sexual Assault. So during the panel at the Conservative Political Action Conference, CPAC, on Saturday, longtime National Review writer, now National Review is a very conservative publication, Mona Charon made an uncontroversial point. Republicans shouldn't sanction sexual misconduct in their own White House. Because he happens to have an R after his name, we look the other way. We don't complain. This is a party that was willing to endorse Roy Moore for Senate, even though he was credibly accused of child molestation. That appeared to be a reference to both President Donald Trump and Rob Porter, the former White House aide, who resigned months after the administration became aware of domestic abuse allegations brought by two of Porter's ex-wives. In the audience, attendees could be heard shouting, not true, not true. Um, Charon was booed earlier in the panel for condemning conference organizers' decision to invite Marianne Marichal Lapin, the niece of far right French politician Marine Le Pen, whose party has flirted with Holocaust denial. When it was over, Charon was escorted out by security. So, um, <clears throat> oh, and then here's a, a, a tweet that somebody wrote about this. This has to be seen to believe to be believed. On an Us Too panel at CPAC, Republican women call out hypocrisy for GOP support for sexual abusers while claiming to care about women, and the crowd immediately boos. Mona Charon, who stunned CPAC by rebuking conservatives for excusing the behavior of Donald Trump and Roy Moore, was just escorted outside by three security guards after her speech. So notice Again, notice the similarity with the last story. 
These are people who just do not, will not, shall not <laughs> believe anything they don't want to believe. They refuse to. It doesn't matter what you tell them. It doesn't matter how you tell them. It doesn't matter how obvious the point is that you stick up in front of them. They're just like, nope, nope, I don't believe it. I don't want to hear it. Um, I refuse to accept it. And that is <clears throat> in part of what we're up against. And when I say we're up against it, I mean, there's always people like that throughout history. You know, any group, anywhere, there's always someone who's just like, I don't believe it. But the difference is those people are encouraged by and supporting people who are in power who operate under the same notion. The current administration is consists largely of people exactly like this. How can I make that statement? Because you can hear and see the things that they're saying. And um, it's just ridiculous. Here's something uh, entitled, I am comfortable saying Donald Trump doesn't understand what's happening with DACA. Interesting. This is from Vox. On Monday, the Supreme Court denied a request from the Trump administration to expedite a decision on DACA. This, this keeps the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program on life support for a few more months and its 690,000 recipients in limbo on whether they will get to stay in the country. Congress still hasn't been able to pass a vote either way. On the latest episode of Today Explained, Vox's Dara Lind and Matthew Iglesias make clear why Congress is in such a stalemate. President Donald Trump has moved the conversation into unfamiliar territory from illegal immigration to legal immigration. Lind elaborates. It's not clear that anyone in the White House actually thought that they were going to be able to get cuts to legal immigration. But if they did think that was possible, it makes sense that they would want to tie it to something that not only Democrats wanted, which was a path to citizenship for dreamers, but that was actually urgent. But by shifting the debate to legal immigration, Trump is making it much harder for Congress to pass a solution to DACA, which is the thing they're ostensibly supposed to be working on. I am confident saying that Donald Trump does not understand what is happening with the DACA program. Oh, shoot. Okay. Well, that wasn't a story. That was the, an introduction to a radio version of a story, which I can't play for you because it's, um, it's a radio version. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. Well, anyway. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So there's where we're at. Uh, let me read this one thing really, really quick, and then we'll sum up because we're getting near the end of the show. Uh, this is from the New York Times. Uh, so just to give you a sense of where the legalities are at this moment. This is entitled, Supreme Court Turns Down Trump's Appeal in Dreamer's Case. So the Supreme Court on Monday declined an unusual White House request that it immediately decide whether the Trump administration can shut down a program that shields some 700,000 young undocumented immigrants from deportation. The move meant that the immigrants often called dreamers, could remain in legal limbo for many months unless Congress acts to make their status permanent. The Supreme Court's decision not to hear the administration's appeal was expected, as no appeals court has yet ruled on the issue. The court's order was brief, gave no reason, and noted no dissents. It said it expected the appeals court to proceed expeditiously to decide this case. President Trump ended the program, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, last September, calling it an unconstitutional use of executive power by his predecessor and reviving the threat of deportation for immigrants who had been brought to the United States illegally as young children. But two federal judges have ordered the administration to maintain major pieces of the program while legal challenges move forward, notably by requiring the administration to allow people enrolled in it to renew their protected status. The administration has not sought stays of those injunctions. The Supreme Court's move will, as a practical matter, temporarily shield the young immigrants who already had signed up for the DACA program from immediate deportation and allow them to keep working legally in the United States. Their status lasts for two years and is renewable. 
The court's decision not to hear the appeal could also relieve the immediate political pressure on lawmakers to permanently address the status of those immigrants or to deal with the additional one million dreamers who had never signed up for the DACA program. They remain at, at risk of deportation if immigration agents find them. Even as he ended the DACA program, Mr. Trump had called upon Congress to give the young immigrants legal status and an eventual path to citizenship before the program was scheduled to expire March 5th. But that proposal has been bogged down in partisan gridlock as members of Congress argue about broader changes to the United States immigration system that the President and his conservative allies in Congress have demanded as part of any deal to address the future of the young immigrants. This month, senators failed to reach consensus in a series of votes on bills to address the Dreamers and other immigration issues. A bipartisan coalition in the Senate roundly rejected a measure backed by Mr. Trump that would have all but ended the family-based migration system that has been in place for decades. A separate bipartisan measure that would have legalized the Dreamers and allocated $25 billion for a wall on the border with Mexico fell six votes short of the 60 needed to proceed to a final vote. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now the court's action is likely to lessen the urgency on Capitol Hill over the issue, making it even more probable that Congress will take no action as the legal process plays out. As a possible fallback plan after the Senate's failure this month, lawmakers could negotiate a short-term patch that would continue the DACA program for a few years, perhaps in exchange for partial funding of Mr. Trump's wall. Such a deal could be tucked into a broad spending bill that lawmakers must approve by March 23rd when government funding is set to expire. But the court's move could undercut any momentum to push for even a very narrow deal in the next few weeks, and there has been little evidence of progress toward any kind of bipartisan pact that would be acceptable to Mr. Trump. House Republican leaders still appear focused on a hardline conservative immigration bill that would be a non-starter in the Senate. While the court's decision appears to have pushed this deadline beyond March, House Republicans are actively working toward a solution said Ashley Strong, a spokeswoman for Speaker Paul D. Ryan of Wisconsin. Mr. Trump has repeatedly condemned Democrats in recent days, accusing them of not caring about the young immigrants. In one recent Twitter post, he said Republicans stand ready to make a deal to protect the Dreamers from deportation. <coughs> Excuse me. But Democrats and some Republicans accuse Mr. Trump and his hardline conservative White House advisors of using the Dreamers as leverage for changes to the immigration system that conservative anti-immigrant activists have long sought. The case at the Supreme Court was brought in California by five sets of plaintiffs. They include four states, California, Maine, Maryland, and Minnesota, and Janet Napolitano, the president of the University of California. As Secretary of Homeland Security in the Obama administration, Ms. Napolitano signed the document that established the program in 2012. In January, Judge William H. Alsop of the Federal District Court in San Francisco <coughs> excuse me, ruled that the administration had abused its discretion and had acted arbitrarily and capriciously in rescinding the program. Judge Nicholas G. Garufus of the Federal District Court in Brooklyn issued a similar ruling this month. The judge acknowledged that presidents have broad powers to alter the policies of earlier administrations, but they said the Trump administration's justifications excuse me my voice is going away on me um, the, the Trump administration's justifications for rescinding the program did not withstand scrutiny. The administration had argued that the program was an unconstitutional exercise of authority by the executive branch, relying on a ruling from the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans concerning a related program. The Supreme Court deadlocked four to four in an appeal of that ruling. The judges said the two programs differed in important ways, undermining the administration's legal analysis. They noted, too, that Mr. Trump had issued conflicting statements about the DACA program. 
Both judges issued nationwide injunctions ordering the administration to retain major elements of the program while the cases moved forward. Such nationwide injunctions from judges in individual cases which have been used to block executive actions in both the Obama and Trump administrations have been the subject of much commentary and criticism. <clears throat> the administration appealed Judge Alsop's ruling to the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco, and that court put the appeal on a fast track. In an unusual move, the administration also asked the Supreme Court to grant immediate review, leapfrogging the appeals court. That procedure, called certi certiorari, 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 before judgment, something like that, is used rarely, typically in cases involving national crises like President Harry S. Truman's seizure of the steel industry and President Richard M. Nixon's refusal to turn over tape recordings to a special prosecutor. In a statement, the Justice Department said it would continue to make its legal arguments as the case proceeded. While we were hopeful for a different outcome, the Supreme Court very rarely grants certiorari, certiorari before judgment, though in our view it was warranted for the extraordinary injunction requiring the Department of Homeland Security to maintain DACA, said Devin O'Malley, a spokesman for the department. We will continue to defend DHS's lawful authority to wind down DACA in an orderly manner. Lawyers for the challengers expressed satisfaction with Monday's developments. We are pleased that the Supreme Court is allowing the normal appellate process to run its course, said Theodore J. Boutros, who represents people affected by the program. DACA is a lawful and important program that protects young people who came to this country as children and who know this country as their only home. In a brief urging the Supreme Court to deny review, excuse me, <clears throat> lawyers for the University of California wrote that it has been nearly 30 years since the court granted certiorari before judgment without the benefit of a court of appeals ruling on the question presented. In a second brief, lawyers for the four states wrote that no national emergency warranted use of the unusual procedure. Since 2012, the DACA program has allowed hundreds of thousands of young people to receive deferred action, work authorization, and other benefits, they wrote. The district court's preliminary injunction only partially and temporarily restores the situation that existed prior to petitioner's abrupt decision to terminate the program, and only for individuals who had already received preferred deferred action under DACA. Petitioners are entitled to a prompt appeal the brief said, but there is no imminent deadline posing a critical threat to the public interest of the sort that might justify bypassing the normal channels for that review. In the administration's brief, Solicitor General Noel F. J. Francisco told the justices that an ongoing violation of federal law being committed by nearly 700,000 aliens required the Supreme Court to act. But he did not ask the court to stay Judge Alsop's injunction while the case moved forward. Mr. Francisco wrote that an immediate stay would interfere with the administration's goal of an or orderly wind-down of the program. <clears throat> so that I thought that would be useful in giving you a sense of where we're at legally at this point. Um, from things I've read and we've discussed earlier in shows a while back, I don't think there is a lot of grounds for legal action on this because DACA was an executive action and uh, Trump's undoing that executive action. I mean, it's this is not something that really has the kind of support uh, foundation, I don't think, that would give it support in the long run. So I will not be surprised if ultimately these uh, lawsuits are turned down and in the winding down of DACA can continue. Um, but it's good that this is happening now because Congress is, is just seemingly hamstrung in their ability to do anything about it, and they need to act. And Trump needs to get out of the way, and we need to put as much pressure on as many people as possible to make that happen because um, we cannot 
just allow them to ride roughshod over uh, everyone and everything in their pursuit of, of some kind of nationalist agenda. Uh, there are a lot of people in this country who are here without documentation. That is clear. That is uh, a problem for any administration because when you create laws, it your credibility is based in large part on your enforcement of those laws. And so it is very difficult to say, well, here's all these people that have, you know, bypassed your laws, that are ignoring your laws, um, but you should let them do that because they're good people and they deserve some relief. I understand that that's a difficult situation and that's a difficult thing to ask of any administration who is charged with um, f enforcing the law. And uh, so unlike a lot of activists, I wasn't as, you know, uh, anti-Obama administration in their uh, efforts to enforce Im immigration law, you know, deporter in chief and all the things people are calling Obama. I felt that that was too much, but I saw what I saw from my vantage point, and maybe it's easy for me to say because I'm not going to be deported um, at any point, I hope, I don't think. Um, but what I saw from my vantage point was it an administration struggling with, on one hand, the necessity to enforce existing law and being responsible and charged with that mandate, basically, and on the other hand, trying to figure out some ways of improving those laws so they were not so damaging to the people that uh, were being caught up in them. I understand that problem, and I don't know how I would have uh, reacted to it had it been me in that position. <clears throat> but, you know, that's just kind of how, that's just the way this whole thing is set up, and uh, it's, it's a difficult thing, and I don't know how you deal with it. So even though I disagreed with a lot of what was going on, I understood why it was happening, I felt. But this administration is a complete uh, different thing. It's like night and day, and they're trying really hard to hurt people, um, to make examples of people, to, uh, to just get as many of them out. If they could may wave a magic wand, they would do it and just make everyone disappear that they didn't like. Um, and that's just, you know, that's unacceptable. So I'll push back against these people with every bit of force that I have available to me, and I hope you will do the same. Uh, the best thing you can do is vote. Uh, vote these people out. <laughs> vote for people who will not, who will overturn their, uh, everything they've done and everything they're trying to do, and just basically try and get us pointed in a direction that we want to go. We will not solve all our problems in one election. And this is where people kind of seem to uh, be confused. They, these are steps. We're trying to take steps in the direction that we want to go, to turn the country towards where we want it to, to be headed. And that's all that voting does. It's not a solution to a problem. It is a step away from that problem towards a solution. And you've got to think of voting that way as a process like that. Anyway, I've completely run out of time. I've got to go. I thank you for listening. This has been CU Immigration here on WRFU LP, Urbana 104.5 FM and UPTV. And I hope to see you next time. Bye.